Hey. We know who Jack is. Jack O'Lantern. It's February 17th, 2023. The Deltarune community has more or less cooled down since a while ago, from both the information that was gained from the Spanton sweepstakes as well as the first issue of the Undertale Deltarune newsletter, which assured everyone that this time, absolutely, surely, Chapter 3 was nearing completion. Many theorists have been off doing a variety of discussion videos, analyses, or other personal projects after discussing the bulk of what they could from the last chapter and more recent events. And a certain nerd gremlin thing in the snowy cabin somewhere may or may not have been preparing to record the audio for a video series discussing the game's meta narrative in copious amounts of detail. Overall, the fandom is in a state of anticipation, eagerly awaiting new developments, tearing as deep as they possibly can into the carcasses of the sweepstakes and the 2021 demo of Deltarin possibly even making unique interpretations of their own of what the game's next chapters may look like, and debating endlessly about things like how Dark World history works, or when the next chapters are going to come out, or god knows what else. And in the middle of this anticipation and discussion, a channel that lies deep in the depths of YouTube uploads its first video, simply titled Party Dojo Pre-Cyber Walkthrough, this channel in question simply being called Staggering Winds. And from both the description and the video itself, there is... Absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. It is just a three minute walkthrough going over every single thing you can do in the dojo in Chapter 2 of Deltarune before you go to the cyber world. In fact, the next two videos that will be uploaded on the same day as this one are of a similar nature. A playthrough of a section of the Cyber City, and a showcase of the teacup chest puzzle, with only the description, don't be shy to backtrack every now and then. While it might seem strange to have a channel that's just uploading random playthroughs of the game, let alone parts of it that have been out for well over a year now, it's not necessarily that uncommon. Hell, you'll find people uploading stuff like this of the game even now. It's not new whatsoever for people to just upload videos of random gameplay. So, this just exists among a sea of channels and videos that do the exact same thing. Or at least, that would be, if it weren't for a fourth video, also uploaded on the same day as these other three. One just titled, Short Clip. A small clip of a playthrough of Delta in Chapter 1, showcasing lesser-known rooms of the cliffs. Immediately, before even watching the video itself, something is off. This is the second room of the cliffs from Chapter 1, but now it has a path going down? And upon going through that path and further to the right, there are more completely new rooms of this area, until the player is led to a dead end, with a sign that only reads, The Strongest Persevere With Patience. How exactly did this channel, who from here on I'll be calling just Winds, get this new path in the cliffs to appear? And why do they speak of it so nonchalantly, as if this is something that people can just find when they're the only one to have found it, as far as we know, let alone document it? And, most of all, who is Winds? And how else could their version of Deltarin vary from ours? Hello, and happy late spooky month. I wanted to diverge a little bit from the device theory this time around and make a smaller video about something that felt fittingly October-ish. I know it's not October anymore, but honestly, fuck it. November is just another October to me until a bit before Thanksgiving. You're not convincing me otherwise. And for those wondering, don't fret, part 3 will be done sooner or later. But with that aside, as of this video, it's been over 5 years since Survey Program released, and since then, Deltarune has grown to be, by far, my favorite ongoing project at the moment, and I'm sure that a lot of other people can say the same. And I think one of my favorite things about it, even if not originally planned, is the fact that it's been releasing in installments. 
I never really was around for the peak of the Undertale fandom, aside from being one of those people who was outside looking in, so I never really had a good first-hand experience with something like Undertale AUs, that is aside from one AU in particular that probably is worth its own video, honestly. But I mention AUs because I firmly believe that one of the most important parts of Deltarune to me is how it explores themes of nostalgia, and in the context of video games especially, explores and essentially fucks with the player's sense of curiosity and this idea of what could be, leading both players and even data miners down this path where they'll find these breadcrumbs of what might come in the future, both caster related and otherwise. It kind of harkens back to the days of watching old hoax videos about multiplayer maps in Call of Duty being haunted or some other secrets in games that were never proven to be real, but you just couldn't help but think that maybe people just haven't looked hard enough. And I think it's because of this way that the game makes people so curious to dig into it more and thus make them speculate harder on what could happen later down the line, plus Deltarune's currently incomplete state, that Deltarune AUs and fan games have this unique quality to them, and that they often end up being very reflective of not only the amount of knowledge the fandom currently has of the game, but also end up usually being intense by the community itself to predict what the rest of the game might look like. This doesn't apply to every AU of course, but back then I imagine you definitely weren't going to be getting something like a vision crew for Undertale, or like a dozen different ideas of what a certain future boss was going to look like because everything was already fully set in stone from the jump. Point is, everyone's going to have their own interpretations of what the future, and especially the end of Deltarune, is going to look like. I know I do. But it's for that reason that I find the several schools of thought and theories about it so intriguing. There is something about this game that just makes people go goddamn insane with theories and speculation, and I really do think that it's by design. Even if I wouldn't call myself an avid AU enjoyer, I can appreciate how much these different takes on the future of the game make me think more about just how limitless the possibilities still feel. Which brings me back to Staggering Winds. If you know anything about me, aside from being a huge enjoyer of Deltarune and quirked up indie games of the like, you probably also know that I am a sucker for ARGs or web series or the like. Just any form of online media that uses its online aspect to its advantage as a tool to tell its story in a way that most other mediums aren't really going to accomplish. And the spam and sweepstakes for me left this pit in my stomach that I didn't even know that I had for wanting to see something of a Deltarune ARG or web series. It feels like the kind of game to me that could definitely pull that sort of thing off. When you look at how the rollout of both chapters have been done, as well as the sweepstakes and just how the game presents itself meta-wise, I feel like it's just asking for some kind of proper ARG to happen. The pieces are all there for it to take place. And while this isn't quite a Deltarune web series in the sense that I had just spoken of, Staggering Winds is a Deltarune thing in the web series format. And not only that, but one that currently isn't even making its own take on future chapters necessarily, as much as it's taking what we already have and twisting it in a way. Making it just so slightly different, with a few additions of its own, but working mostly within the bounds of what was already there. With only six videos of substance so far, and mostly short ones at that, I think you'll see that what makes this alternate take on the game so unique to me isn't just that it's working purely with what we already have, but as from these videos as things that this player of Deltarune has just discovered. As if they've always been there for wins. Framing them not solely as leaks, but as easter eggs. Secrets. And given my takes on Deltarune fundamentally incorporating something like hunting for secrets into the design and themes of the game, this channel couldn't be much more in line with that design philosophy to me. It's a strangely cathartic look into what Deltarune could be in a way that not even making a Chapter 3 fan game could pull off in my opinion. And ever since just happening to stumble upon the channel by pure chance, I've just had a feeling about this so far short series that I think I can only put to rest by making a video about what there is of it currently so that maybe more people can give it a look. I want to take you through each of these videos of this channel, analyzing them like I would anything else, and not only try to piece together what a potential narrative there might be to this series, but also use these videos to ponder just how out there this game could get. It's one of many, many interpretations of how things in Deltrin could change and evolve later on, and maybe it's not the kind of thing that's for everyone. But damn it, the kid in me that used to watch totally real and not faked videos about secret easter eggs in my favorite games just wants to indulge a little bit. And for something as weirdly Halloween appropriate as Deltarune, it only makes sense to allow it, just this once. Though of course, if you haven't watched the series itself, I do recommend that you do so before watching this because there's quite a few surprises for you in store if you haven't actually seen it yet. So without further ado, get comfy, and let us do as much of a deep dive as we currently can into Staggering Winds.
As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, Staggering Winds started uploading on February 17th of 2023, more particularly uploading four videos on that day. The channel itself even appears to have been created on February 17th, so we can tell this channel was made with the intent to upload these videos first thing. There isn't much more to say about the channel itself, as there is no description, nor is there any contact information or other accounts linked to it. So as far as we know, this is the only account that is related to anything involving this narrative, so to speak. Which brings us to the videos themselves. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the first three videos of the channel are completely normal in contents. As far as I could gather, they are unmodified and completely average gameplay of Deltarune Chapter 2, and the descriptions of these videos don't show anything of note either, aside from some insubstantial remarks from Winds. The only somewhat notable thing is in Cyber City Playthrough, where on a few brief occasions we can get a glimpse at this person's save file, which is simply named Winds. Aside from that though, there isn't anything else of note for these videos, so we move on to the fourth video, which is the first one of any real substance, that being Short Clip. Wins describes this video as just a showcase of the lesser known rooms of the cliffs, which I've already pointed out as being bizarre since this is literally the only video to even hint at, let alone document the presence of these rooms in the game. In it, we see an altered version of the second room of the cliffs from Chapter 1. Now, I will say that I do like how this room is altered, because in the original version of this room, there is this weird, like, extension of the lower end of the platform that the save point is on. I never actually thought much of it until now, but I could totally see how this would look like it's supposed to lead somewhere, and yet it's just this small chunk that's poking out, like it's waiting for something to be added onto it. So, it could potentially add more credence to how Wins talks about these lesser-known rooms, like, the potential for it may have actually been there in the game this whole time. I don't know, I just think that's a really cool way to expand on it. But moving on, Wins goes down this new path and then slides down to a lower level, and further into this portion of the cliffs, only to be met with a dead end after a long way up, with a sign that only reads, The Strongest Persevere With Patience, before the video ends. Now, with this video alone, there isn't much to get out of it. While the intent of this channel appears to be just showcasing random parts of what seem to be just average Delta in gameplay, this short clip suggests that Wins' copy of the game is… unique. Or maybe that they know something that no one else does about its secrets, but that would raise a lot of questions about how they would have discovered something like this and why they speak of it as if they're not the only one to know about something like these rooms in the cliffs. Furthermore, the sign at the end raises questions of its own and yet also doesn't have much to get out of it, as it's currently rather cryptic. And without a better idea of how big this new area in the cliffs actually is, we can't really parse anything more from it. What I can parse, at least, is given the fact that Wins is the only person ever to document this, it's possible that their copy is simply just different fundamentally. How that is, and why that is, though, we can't currently pin down with just a 40-something second clip. However, on April 22nd, that would eventually change. At this time, a new video is uploaded to the channel. And before we even get into the video itself, several things are now very much different in presentation compared to the last four videos. Previously, each video was titled in lowercase and each description even being written in all lowercase. We could assume that the same person was responsible for the uploading of these four videos and that this person is indeed wins. But with this video, we can tell right away that this is someone else just from the title, given that the casing is completely different, and instead of the usually short, matter-of-fact titles, this one is now framed more formally, describing a new cut item in the game that supposedly exists called the Goner Piece, showcasing it after it was restored and then going on to call this the January 2021 prototype of Chapter 2. We'll get to that in just a bit. But the description ends up confirming that this is in fact another person that has uploaded this video. It's Wins' sibling, as Wins stepped out a while ago and hasn't really done much YouTube-wise. So now his sibling is taking the reins for the time being to try and upload more to the channel. Wins' sibling went to use the PC to play Deltarune and mess around with Wins' debug version of the game, which eventually led to the discovery of the Goner piece. And there it is, another mention of this being a completely different version of Deltarune from the one that was made for release. This may at least explain how Wins was able to access those lesser-known rooms in the cliffs, as he may have in fact been playing on a version of the game that well predated the finished one. So, who knows what else is different, right? Well, let's take a look at the video itself. Before we do though, I want to interject real quick to help clear up something in light of a recent development. Originally, I was referring to the uploader of the first four videos of this channel as Wins, and the uploader for the videos after as Wins' sibling. For reasons you're going to see much later in the video, from this point forward, I'm now going to refer to the first uploader as the original Wins and his sibling as Just Wins. You'll likely end up seeing why once you get far enough in. 
Now, back to the video. The footage starts in what looks like a much earlier version of a room in the cyber field and shows Swins walking around a bit before opening the inventory and showing the Garner piece, with it being described as a small and gray piece of something you don't recognize. It looks staticky. The Garner piece is used as the narration freezes for a bit before throwing up a jumble of letters and numbers and The game then goes to the dog check screen, before it disappears with the mystery ghost sound effect, as we then see Chris, in the middle of quite literally nowhere with the wind ambience playing. It's worth noting, though, that this jumble of letters, at least until it hits the Q spamming, does actually have meaning, as it's a base 64 string. When translated, it simply reads, Staggering Winds. With this in mind, the full phrase is likely meant to read something like, You use the staggering winds. Moving on, Chris walks up, and we see the game say that your voice echoes aimlessly, appearing to use the placeholder text that was written for the scrapped overall talk function in the game's files. And then, we see Chapter 1's unused script being written nearly line for line, and Wind finds a monochrome version of the Dreamer House, to which they walk in. Here, a much slower version of You Can Always Come Home plays, as we see that the house completely lacks any presence of Toriel. No cheriel, the phone doesn't work, and the trash can lacks any flowers. When Chris goes upstairs and checks the bookshelf, though, the game's text and music glitches again upon getting to How to Draw Dragons, displaying a bunch of garbage text, or no text, and trying to refer to some object or NPC that the game isn't able to actually call forth, before the game then says, You got the Garner Relic. And then, upon entering Chris and Azriel's room, while Azriel's side of the room mostly just lacks the desk with the computer, Chris's side is replaced entirely with just boxes. And before the player can go any further, they get a call. The person on the other end claims to be calling on the behalf of the Dreamer residents asking for Chris's name. Upon giving it though, the caller says that it doesn't ring any bells, and even when seeing that they're Azriel's sibling, that Azriel has always been an only child, before just moving on and saying that if they know Azriel, to tell him that we're almost all set for him to pack, and that they wish him good luck on university, before hanging up. Whatever this other version of the Dreamer house is, it appears to be one where Chris was at least never adopted, and thus was never Azriel's sibling. I get the feeling in general that this version of the house is in the middle of being moved out of, with Azrael in particular moving out thanks to him going to university. But a lot of the finer details are left intentionally kind of fuzzy to me, and I'll be real, this section in general is just kind of inscrutable. I can't be sure who the hell was calling Chris here exactly, and furthermore how to release the stuff in the bigger picture of this series, let alone to Des and the unused lines in this context. Like, your guess is as good as mine, the series just hasn't really elaborated on this fucking Amori black space looking ass sequence. But moving on, the talk function dialogue plays again, before then printing some of Chapter 2's unused script dialogue. And then, suddenly, your felt your pocket begin to shine. Your body felt lighter than normal and the damage sound plays before cutting to black yet again. And from this point, we hear the audio drone sound effect before fucking Gaster speaks to the player. He remarks that the player has, interestingly, found an item of great value, but one that carries a lot of potentially dangerous side effects with it, and advises to use it with care. Gaster does say that while the balance of the world is now all out of whack, he is able to restore it, but as a favor, wants the player to seek out those who are lost and guide them into the light with the Garner artifacts more or less being means of doing that guiding, as they will remain with you in the dark. And at the end, the game cuts to a debug menu of sorts, giving the player a small list of rooms to load. We only really know the contents of the maze room though, which the player loads back into. And unlike the beginning of the video, Susie now has something new to say. Asking if Chris is alright and that they are spacing out for a few minutes, Chris seems to tell Susie that they're fine and Susie goes with it, just telling Chris to not keep her waiting next time. And the video ends there. Jesus Christ, well that's a lot fucking more than the last video, wasn't it? It's a little hard to say where to begin, really. But at a baseline, we do now actually have a sort of foundation to work with in regards to what the story behind this channel actually is, and one that we can build off of in future videos to come. While there is a lot of new elements and terminology thrown in, it can at least now be used as reference to make better sense of what's actually going on here. We know now that whoever the original Winds is, he got a hold of a much earlier prototype build of Delta in Chapter 2, 
Although, we don't know exactly how the original ones got a hold of this prototype, nor do we know how his sibling managed to restore the Goner piece item, as it was described as in the title. And as for the Goner piece itself, along with the relic, they appear to be a kind of fundamentally game-altering object. Given that it's a piece of something, there are likely more of these pieces that'll come together to form a whole other thing. While the exact function of the Garner piece is a bit up in the air thanks to the fucking lynchian nature of what had happened upon using it, and the fact that Gaster had to intervene, we can say confidently that things like the Garner piece may have been what caused something like the changes to the cliffs in the previous video. These are objects in the game that are capable of altering things between playthroughs, hell, even just upon loading the same playthrough multiple times if the end of this video is anything to go off of. This also seems to be where the Staggering Winds name for the channel came from, judging from the dialogue that displayed upon using the Garner piece. So at least we can say that the original Winds probably already knew of the Garner piece well before even creating the channel itself. And now that the player has acquired, and used one in this video, Caster gives them a request. To find those who are lost, whoever those people might be. And to that end, I think that's all that can really be said about this one. The establishing of not only who Wins is and what's caused them to discover things that no one else has, but a better idea of the means behind those discoveries as being potentially game-altering items that were never properly implemented. But now that they've been restored, that of course leaves but a simple question. We were already told pretty blatantly by Gaster that the acquisition of these items is going to cause some pretty significant effects to the game potentially. So... How else could a discovery like this alter the game? Well, we wouldn't get another look into that until May 15th. Our next video is completely empty for a title, and a description being in a lowercase may imply that this was uploaded by the original Winds, simply stating that it was taken from a recent session at the beginning of Chapter 2. As for whether the uploader actually is the original ones or not, I'll touch on that later, as this kind of raises some new questions now with the continuity of this series so far. But with the context of the previous video, we can say that these sessions are now referring to Wins documenting the ways that the game changes and alters itself upon separate playthroughs of Deltarune, after having acquired a Goner piece. And one more thing actually, this is something that I nearly forgot to include in the script even, but as I was downloading the videos for this analysis onto my PC, when I got to this untitled video, the file name displayed as six blank spaces or underscores. I don't have anything to really add to that, but it definitely caught me off guard when starting this analysis, so make of that what you will. This video begins with what is supposed to be the beginning of Chapter 2, where Chris arrives late to class. But this time, only them and Susie are present. Everyone else has just not shown up for whatever reason. So Susie, being kind of weirded out by this and wondering what happened, suggests that Chris go look for Alfies and the others while Susie stays behind. The footage then cuts to Chris in the library, going upstairs to where the bookshelves would be, except now there's no funny hometown denizen there, and instead of two bookshelves in the middle, there is now a completely clear opening into, again, the middle of nowhere. And going forward, along with a completely unique song playing here, we see the Goner Vessel. It speaks to Wins, and says that it's appeared to further warn him about the consequences of using the Garner piece, even prompting to turn the game off immediately if he doesn't understand them. Upon listening further, though, we learn that an artifact that Wins found has been starting to alter the game gradually ever since acquiring it, and that it may be due to it reflecting the Garner's desires to be included in Deltarune, but that, as a result, it could change anything in the game, even something as severe as its endings. We then learn that the intro to Chapter 2 was changed so significantly because the Garner vessel itself used a Garner piece of their own to change it, to ensure that Wins would find them. And for taking the time to listen, they give their piece to Wins and hope that it'll guide him towards more of the goners to restore them before vanishing, as the video ends not too long after. This seems to be a doubling down of what's actually going on with the goner pieces, and that there are in fact multiple of them to collect, likely upon finding a goner vessel. It's a further development of the request that Gaster offered in the previous video, an instance of finding someone lost in the dark and getting their goner piece, so that you can use it to restore them, though we don't really know what restoring a goner in the series really entails currently. But from here on, we can assume that we'll continue seeing how these Garner artifacts change the game, in both small and large ways. There isn't much more to pull out of this, so let's continue on to the next video, uploaded just a few days later on May 17th. This one is simply titled Shopkeeper Visit, another one that might be by the original Winds. He specifies that this is a continuation of the previous video, as this is where he's used the Garner piece from that video to get some new dialogue from Sham. 
And one thing I want to note, actually, before talking about anything else, is that, for some reason, there is one very specific change made to Shalm's shop in this session compared to how the shop normally looks. The stall on the upper left shelf is supposed to be Yoki, from Temi's games Dweller's Empty Path and Escaped Chasm. But in this specific video, it's been changed to be the lonely girl protagonist from Escaped Chasm. Which is such a weird Mandela effect-ass change that I can't ever begin to wrap my head around, but you know what? That's fucking cool. Temi Gaming mentioned, you love to see it. Anyway, upon having this piece and talking to Sham, they are completely confounded at the sight of it, as they go on to say that the Garner piece is a very rare item that's said to have been used in an experiment and was kept away due to some catastrophic event, but that not even they really know much more about it. And when talking to them again, they questioned the idea of the player knowing more about the artifact than Sham, perhaps alluding to the fact that this experiment could have been referring to Gaster, and even perhaps Entry 17. They acknowledge that it does seem like it's all starting to come together in a way, but they now wonder if the player will use this type of power to just expand the possibilities of what could happen, or if they'll use it to save those that are in the dark. But then, for some reason, everything just… stops for what's something like 16 to 17 seconds as Sham holds a surprised expression. It doesn't seem like there's anything of note here, other than just complete and utter darkness and silence. But as if that pause hadn't even happened at all, everything then just continues on as normal again, as Sham goes on about their usual nihilist happy doomer grind set. And that's where this one ends. Given how short this video is, there isn't exactly too much to get out of this one either, but it's yet another case of the game undergoing more and more sudden changes, to the extent that not even characters like Sha may be able to really keep up with or make sense of it. And of course, there's a more direct allusion here about how these pieces seem to be related to Gaster and his experiments, and that whatever it was that went wrong in those experiments might have caused not only Gaster to shatter, but these Goner pieces as well. If I had to theorize, at least in the scope of this series, maybe Gaster wants the player to seek those who are lost, or in other words, to find more of these Garner pieces in an effort to put what's currently broken back together. It would certainly be a more substantial expansion on what little we do know of what made Gaster into what he is now, as well as what caused something like the Garners to take form. But I just can't be sure right now. So far, the narrative has been pretty consistently showing how much the game has been able to change just from this unused feature now being restored. Things that you wouldn't even have thought twice about now open entire new doors of possibilities. But it's also raised so many more questions as a result. And as much as I do want to go deeper into that, as we've seen a lot of really intriguing things already take place in this series, we do still have one more video to go over. Uploaded on July 13th. And it's pretty fucking bizarre. In this video, I- <clears throat> Sorry. In this video, Wentz has now become well aware of the small differences between playthroughs, after acquiring the Garner piece and Relic some videos ago. Though they do note that, for whatever reason, the screen capture they used for this video reacted in a strange way, and to not mind any visual glitches that may pop up. This session starts right as Susie and Chris meet in the cliffs in Chapter 1, and goes as normal. Until, Susie herself now feels like she's already been here and done all of this with Chris before. The player agrees, and Susie begins to remember past playthroughs of the game, stating that they must have gone through here countless times by now. Although, she does remark that it surely wouldn't hurt to do it again, and as she begins following Chris, a weird route jingle plays. Upon moving forward, the normal path is now blocked off, requiring Chris and Susie to take a detour, further confusing Susie and giving her memories of having already been in this situation before. As how would she know that this was supposed to be the normal path forward? Going up, they find a warp door that takes them to the top of Card Castle, before finding Lancer. And this interaction reveals that not only does Susie not remember Lancer fully, but Lancer's dad has also vanished in this playthrough, which has left him pretty confused. And then, to Lancer's further confusion, as the screen moves to the left, we see different versions of Chris and Susie, now with Rouse, acting as they normally would at the end of Chapter 1 before the King fight. And in true Lancer fashion, this guy just fucking books it out of there. But the Chris that's being played as moves towards the fun gang, before the video glitches and the player finds themselves on some path in the middle of nowhere suddenly, as the wind ambience plays once again. A sign can be read as the player approaches the corner that reads, It never ends. The winds always carry on, telling many stories. The player then walks onward, towards another dead end, before the video glitches again, as Chris is met in a battle with… themselves, in complete silence, described only in name with three question marks. 
This other Chris doesn't do any attacks and just cycles through a few lines upon checking or talking to it, such as, It is when we're monitored, we get a strong sense of connection. It's all too familiar. You can see me, can you? Wynn sees that there's an ability that they can use if they gather enough TP called Approach, and so decide to defend on each turn until they have enough TP to use it. And upon doing so... The game actually seems to crash at this point when the Everman and Wingdings appear, judging from the spread animations completely freezing here. And the Wingdings itself translates to, We shall meet soon, Wins. Now with that, that is where we are currently left off with the Staggering Wins channel. Since then, it hasn't uploaded anything new, and given that there's no other accounts that appear to be related to it, there's no way of really knowing if there will be more updates to this account. Though, I'd hope so. It still feels like there's a lot of potential with this series, and a lot of questions still left unanswered. And while I can't be certain about the future state of Staggering Winds, as it hasn't uploaded in a while, I think a little speculation about what we do have currently still wouldn't hurt. So, let's try giving a crack at it and see how horribly off or on the mark I'll end up being, assuming that the series is planned to update more in the future. Now, whenever tackling any web series, or really anything in general that's open-ended like this, I feel the easiest way to make sense of it while also avoiding going into the realm of just solely making random guesses is to take what we have currently and ask the most pressing questions that one would have upon watching it in its current state. And I think at this moment, the questions I'm most prompted to ask right now about the series are, what actually is the continuity in this series currently? What are the goner pieces or goner relic exactly, and what do they really do? What is Gaster's motive in the context of this series? How did Wins actually get a hold of this prototype build of Deltarune? And what can we say about the endgame of this series given the acquiring of the Goner pieces and what's already taken place in the story thus far? Let's start with the whole continuity thing. So, at the beginning of this series, the timeline is pretty straightforward. We know that the original Wins has uploaded the first four videos. But it's with the later four where things get… odd. One could assume potentially that the Untitled Video and Shopkeeper Visit are both uploaded by the original Winds, and the latter takes place after the former. We can at least confirm the timeline of these two videos in a vacuum, but it's when we take the videos from his sibling into account that I don't really know where they fit into it. If the original Winds is the one that uploaded these two videos, then it would have to imply that Winds and his sibling are experiencing or have already experienced different versions of this phenomenon, but it would also imply that the series is following two narratives simultaneously. And while it does sound like an interesting idea, it's also really hard to wrap my head around it ultimately given the progression of items and events that have taken place since the Goner Piece restoration. And I can't really be certain if that's actually the case given what we have right now. If we were to go with this train of thought though, then the original ones may be a lot more knowledgeable on what the Goner Pieces actually are for, while his sibling is only starting to notice some of the more significant effects of looking into it themselves. Hell, we know now that Staggering Winds may have been ripped straight from a line of dialogue about the Goner piece, so clearly the original Winds would have been in the loop about it well before making the channel itself. That is, if the choice of name is an in-game decision. Or in other words, if it's what Winds actually picked in character rather than it being simply a name for the series and nothing more. And while there is a bit of confusion since the latest video from his sibling does refer to them as Winds, it's important to know that this is the name that was given to the save file that's being played on, according to the second video at least. And we have no reason right now to assume that any other player names are being used in this series. So it might be referring to Winds as a way of just referring to the player in general, whether or not that actually is the original Winds or his sibling. So with that established, what about the build itself that Winds got a hold of? 
As in, how the fuck did they actually get a build of Deltarune Chapter 2 from January of 2021, eight months before the demo was officially released? Well, honestly, because of how little acknowledgement of this there actually is, I'll be real, I don't really know. Wince talks about this debug version in an extremely nonchalant way, and it's hard to speculate because there's just no elaboration whatsoever about this. Maybe later in the series that'll change, but currently it's just not something that's really had all that much attention called to it in the series itself so far. My only guesses are, currently, that either this guy somehow found it on some really obscure site or through leaking it or some shit, or maybe he was a former developer or knew a developer for Deltarune and just happened to get his hands on this build that way. Or, I don't know, maybe the original Wind is actually literally Toby Fox in this story or something. That's all I got. Sorry. However, what I can go a bit deeper into is, of course, the Goner pieces. To more or less recap about them a bit, we know that the Goner piece is described as being a great piece of something that feels staticky. We also know of at least two Goner pieces that Wins has found, the one that they got from the vessel, and the one that was restored and showcased in another video that led to the relic. We know at least that the restored one pretty much breaks the game and sends Chris to the middle of nowhere. And while a lot of the contents of this nowhere are really up in the air and open to interpretation, I personally think this is a sort of out-of-bound space that houses all of the unused or placeholder content in the game, which includes the unused script, the talk function placeholder text, and also this completely altered version of the Dreamer house and a bizarre version of the game's story where Chris was never a part of the Dreamer family. And while I can't really piece together how that mindfuck of a sequence fits into the bigger picture for the series currently, I can at least say that generally, it seems the Goner pieces are a method of taking the player completely out of bounds, at risk of the game itself being torn apart at the seams, given how Gaster had to intervene and restore balance to the game's world as he puts it. But simultaneously, these Goner pieces can be used to find more of those said pieces and hopefully lead the player to more Goners, which Gaster does advise as being the best use for them upon getting the Goner Relic. Which, speaking of, there is also the Relic, which Vuns found in the Goner Piece video. It's only really mentioned in the initial restoration video, but we don't actually know for sure what it does, nor what it looks like. And I could theorize about it potentially being the Pandora's box that's kickstarted these changes in the game to actually take place. The thing that's actually poking holes in reality that you can't really seal after requiring it. But given how early it is in the series, and how it's only been mentioned by name literally once, I think it's just too soon to say that with confidence. And obviously, I think the connections between these artifacts and Gaster can be seen from a mile away. Clearly, he takes a lot of interest in the player having these items, and he seems rather knowledgeable about how dangerous they can be if they're misused. However, because of these new circumstances, suggests that you continue looking for these pieces, using the ones you already have, to find more goners that are similarly out of bounds. We currently don't really know for what reason exactly Gaster would want the player to do this, but it is what Gaster seems to want ultimately. Which does lead me into the next question of what Gaster's motives actually are in context with this series. And of course, this is a pretty fucking hard question, and answering it in general is very difficult because we know so little about him, even removed from the Staggering Winds context. But if we're working solely in the confines of this series, then we do have a bit more to work with in the Winds version of this character at least. We were told by Sean that the Garner pieces were once used in an experiment a very long time ago before something catastrophic happened, likely referring to Gaster shattering, which would have then shattered whatever the Garner pieces once were into those aforementioned pieces, and thus leading to them being kept away from the rest of the world, or I think in other words, being sent out of bounds. I theorized before that perhaps Gaster wants us to look for more Garner pieces, because if finding a Garner does imply that we'll get a piece, then we'll eventually have more of them, which may eventually lead to Gaster finally having a means of putting them back together into… something. Something that we know was very important for the experiments he was doing in Entry 17. And if we wanted to bring a bit of actual canon lore speculation into the mix, we can say pretty confidently that whatever Gaster was experimenting on did involve Dark Worlds, we just don't know how specifically or to what extent. Although, if I had to guess, in very broad terms at least, if the Garner piece is capable of taking someone out of the bounds of their own reality, then perhaps the device that these pieces were meant to be put together into just has a general function of, well, tearing holes in reality. Not just taking one out of bounds, but being the means to which Gaster may have been able to leave the Undertale reality, for instance, and perhaps even experiment on Dark Worlds through that. But that's simply my assumptions, and that's without even going into the bigger and even more difficult question of Gaster's role in Deltarune to begin with and why the player is so important, but at that point I'm pretty much just one step away from going into your average schizo speculation about Deltarune in general, so I'll stop myself there. 
We can at least confirm that, in the context of Staggering Winds, Gaster could use these pieces to potentially recreate something that was very, very important to his experiments. However, what that says of his motives in the bigger picture, I can't really say because I wouldn't be able to fully answer that even with Deltarune in its original canon state, so yeah. At least, aside from a certain theory that you probably know me pretty well for anyway. But that's for another video. Although, if we are to speak in the bigger picture here, then that would lead us to the last question worth really asking, which is, what can we really say about how the series might continue from where we've currently left off? And to answer that, well... Ah, <sighs> a tale as old as time. Right as I finished writing the script for this video, and even after going through the effort to shorten it so that this video doesn't turn into as much of a feature film, a new video has been uploaded to the channel on November 3rd. And frankly, I'm too lazy to redo the analysis bit from scratch, and after taking a look at the new video, I honestly think it's a good preface for what the fuck's happened in this new one. It has already nearly disproven one of my initial guesses about the series, clarified a few of the questions I already had asked previously about it, and introduces a few more factors into this series and what's going on with it that I hadn't even considered before. So, here is the actual, probably actual, I think, final video that I'll be covering for this analysis of Staggering Winds, his official Let's Play of Undertale. Episode 1, no commentary, let's go. So, the thing I have to address immediately before I even talk about this video is to do with, yet again, the title and description. When I originally have read on my analysis of this series, I was holding firmly onto the belief that the original Winds and his sibling were uploading separately throughout the whole series. More specifically, that the original Winds uploaded not just the first four videos, but also the untitled video and shopkeeper visit, while his sibling uploaded the goner piece and altered cliff route videos, and that there was something along the lines of two different narratives going on. When where the original Winds was having his experience, and a much more knowledgeable one, well before the other narrative that was his sibling experience of the game, where we get a much more real-time idea of what they end up finding. With this new video's release though, unless proven otherwise, I am now completely doing away with this theory because I don't know who the fuck uploaded this of the two if this is the case. And the more I tried to fit this new video into it, the more confused I get. You'll see why as I go on with it, but more or less, if I went with this original theory, then it would have caused a bunch of conflicts with how one character got this item or how another one got that event to happen. So here's my revised version of what I think the continuity in this series actually is. The original Winds uploaded the first four videos while he was documenting random stuff in the first few chapters. He then steps away from YouTube and Winds' sibling, who I am now calling just Winds, takes the reins, and starts uploading to the channel and documenting their discoveries in this version of Deltarune, starting with the goner piece that they found in a Chapter 2 prototype. Then, upon discovering it and interacting with it, things begin to change. This is where the next three videos come in, as these are several sessions that Winds recorded after what he did in the goner piece video. That's about as simple as I can make it, and until specified otherwise, I'm just going to stick with that for my own sanity's sake. But with that in mind, this video is totally, surely, a completely normal playthrough of by the winds themselves. And the description seems to further corroborate this, except for when you look at the bottom, as an edit has been made that just says, what does this all mean? But aside from that, the video starts completely normal. The intro plays and everything is seemingly untouched until Winds makes his way to where Flowey would be, where he is instead met with the everyman that showed up at the end of the previous video. Now, immediately, I'm brought to another realization about this series that is important to take into account. I had thought that perhaps originally, most, if not all, of this series took place within just the January 2021 prototype that Winds restored the Garner piece in. However, upon looking at the title for the Cliff Route video, where it specifies just Delta in Chapter 1, implying that this is the finished version of it, and assuming that the two videos before that were footage of a finished Chapter 2 rather than the prototype, and now also looking at this video, where something that Wind saw in Chapter 1 is now appearing in fucking Undertale, we now have a new problem. The artifacts that he found in that prototype are now affecting every version of Deltarune and even Undertale, and the Everman here seems to confirm this idea given their dialogue. They greet Winds before saying that they have something that they want him to do, acknowledging that a link between what I assume to be Deltarune and Undertale has now presented itself, as they ask the player to close their eyes to get closer to light. And upon doing so, and opening them again, they're now not in the underground anymore, but rather in front of the shelter in Hometown. 
Wins continues exploring from here as they see that Home Tao is now completely empty, with just nature ambience playing as they're now able to walk further down the road that goes past the police station. And upon doing so, they find Susie and Chris, who seem to be looking for where the rest of their classmates went. Which is, weirdly enough, a continuation of what happened in the untitled video, not directly, but implying that the classmates and NPCs in Hometown in general have still completely vanished. Susie and Chris notice Wins, though, and aren't really sure what to do at first, Chris being freaked out from seeing another human, and Susie ultimately not seeming too bothered and just being glad that at least someone else exists in Hometown currently, before just fucking off, I guess. Wins then goes further up the road to where the welcome sign for Hometown is, before going left, and into yet another pocket in nowhere. And here, I was right in the idea that Gaster does want Wins to look for more of the goners. More specifically, we can say that they're meant to look for more of the goner vessels. This vessel now mentions that it was actually the plan to lead Wins to them, as it's part of an interesting experiment that Gaster is trying to do. One that will set him and all of the goners free, and that essentially, the more they're able to have Wins deviate from the intended path, the closer they get to achieving that freedom. And this is where I am especially convinced that every video after short clip has to be from the original Wins' sibling and along just one narrative timeline. Because this vessel mentions that Wins has already collected two goner pieces at this point, this vessel being host to the third goner piece. The goner relic still hasn't been mentioned at all after the first goner piece video, and there's further implications now that perhaps even the pieces themselves are also responsible for things changing spontaneously in Deltarune. Admittedly, stuff like Shom's dialogue and Shopkeeper visit did make it sound like the one in the entitled video was the first one that Wins got, but honestly, I'm just not going to think too hard about it for now. But moving on, the vessel, after commenting on how many pieces you already have, also mentions how, after the last reset, the NPCs in Hometown are still missing. I wouldn't be sure exactly what the last reset refers to, whether it's referring to Wins resetting their save file in Undertale or a different kind of reset pertaining to Deltarune's save files, but this does now establish that as Wins collects more of the pieces, the changes may become more permanent and more significant. Now that they have two pieces, even after that vessel having used it only to ensure that Wins would find them, it's made it so that the people in Hometown have almost entirely vanished, and not only that, but also thanks to what the vessel claims as them becoming more aware of their reality and being able to see beyond it, and that it's the same reason why Wins was even able to reach Hometown through Undertale. And they wrap this up by bringing one more thing into the equation. Through some means, the vessels, and I'd assume Gaster as well, are aware that Wins is uploading and recording these videos to the channel, and that plenty of people have their eyes on it. They add on to this by saying that the viewers are also capable of helping, and that Gaster will be happy to hear about it. This has been actually hinted at before. In the previous video, when Wins had that weird encounter at the end, one of its lines of text was, it is when we're monitored, we get a strong sense of connection. You may remember too that Wins mentioned the screen capture acting odd in that video specifically. So in some way, recording these videos has some deeper effect that not only could damage the video potentially, but also further strengthen a connection of sorts between the game and reality. And I imagine that as the series continues, we'll likely learn more about what this entails. But with that, they give their goner piece to Wins and vanish. So, where do I even begin with this? Again, I'm kind of glad that I did the analysis bit before covering this video because this introduces so much new shit that I almost see it as more of a preface for this new lore dump essentially to the Windsiverse. For one thing, we do now have a better idea of what Gaster's motives actually are. I think the Garner pieces are still meant to be put together, and Gaster is intending on using the player and their ability to go out of bounds with these pieces to free himself and all the other Garners in the dark. However, this seems to also come with the cost of significantly altering the world of Deltarune, and it even explains how things like the small changes occurring between playthroughs is taking place. It's not just personalization or stuff changing just because, it's stuff changing and characters in the game now becoming slightly more self-aware of their reality. What was once Susie's initial questioning of Chris spacing out has now become Susie remembering past playthroughs and going through the same motions many, many times already. And we can assume that the NPCs in Hometown pretty much all realize the nature of their reality a lot more quickly upon getting the first few goner pieces, which has caused a more irreversible effect. And I imagine as Wind collects more of them, that the lines between each version of Deltarune and Undertale, and whatever the fuck Aster in this series is trying to do, are only going to become more blurred and interlinked with each other. The scope of the effects that the Garner artifacts carry is definitely a lot wider than even I initially thought, but honestly, I do still find it pretty fucking cool. 
Like, while realistically I don't imagine anything in Deltarune actually affecting anything in the Undertale world, especially not something like your Undertale save file or stuff in Undertale affecting things in Deltarune, I think in a vacuum this is a really interesting way to expand on the surreal nature of what Gaster may be doing. If this is just what the third Goner piece was like to get, then how much weirder are the next ones going to be for Wins to find? As for everything else that I already theorized about though, I do still think that most of it does hold up relatively well. The artifacts in general are very powerful, each one seemingly increasing Wint's ability to break out of bounds, lead them to the other goners, and guide them to the light. Though, again, we don't really know the full extent exactly to what the light, or freeing or restoring everyone actually entails. And I get the feeling we probably won't know that for certain for a good while. Obviously, we're still a ways off from being able to really pin everything down, but this video is certainly a hell of a clarification on some of it. And so, with having covered everything so far, like, actually, that does more or less put me at the end of the road until Staggering Winds uploads more videos in the future. Although, there's a good chance that I may come back to this series later if it uploads enough or even if it reaches something of an ending. And for that reason, I think it wouldn't hurt to do perhaps a little recap of everything we've covered so far to really put a bow on this shorter analysis. So, let me try to put the story so far into something that'll be easy to remember, which I think, currently, goes something along these lines. One day, Wint and his siblings somehow get a hold of a much earlier build of Delta in Chapter 2. In it, there are unused items that, when restored, reveal a new feature of the game that involves a changing as a reflection of the Garner's desire to be involved in the game, as well as Gaster wanting the player to look for more of these items. And with the acquiring of them, they not only fundamentally change things in this build of Chapter 2, but in Delta Rune as a whole and even in Undertale to some extent. The original Wins may have known of this feature rather thoroughly and was originally documenting some obscure and random tidbits of Deltarin, but decided to step away from YouTube, leaving his sibling to take the reins. And from there, as they discover this lost feature and document their own weird changes and events that occur from that point forward, they're now sent on a quest to find more Goner pieces and aid in a new experiment that Gaster is doing. One that will free him and the Goners, as well as potentially will form a very important part of his former experiments, while significantly affecting Deltarune and Undertale's worlds in the process. And the plot is only beginning to thicken with this series with what the newest video's vessel goes over. The Goner pieces and what they do is starting to be put more into perspective now, as is Gaster's motive for sending the player out to find more of these pieces, and the effects of them are proving to be much more significant than just changing things in Deltarune. And while I may have already had this notion before about the series, I think with the new video it only nails in my belief further that, for a good while now, Wins has been staring deeply into the abyss of unused content, curiosity, and secrets for this game. And, I believe from this point forward in the series, the abyss now seems to be staring back. And really, that's about all I can say about this series, at least in its current state. As I mentioned before, this is still a pretty small series so far. I'd say it's only getting started in terms of what it may explore and the story that it may be trying to tell. And there's also these fraying details that I haven't even touched further on in this video still, like a few signs that were read in short clip in the alternate route discovery, which do feel important, but currently it's hard to pin down what they actually mean here, and I can say that about a lot of things in this series, honestly. But I never really made this video because I wanted to solve it. I feel that would be like trying to use the first five videos of Petscop or any series with an even remotely complex story as your only source of solving it. Good fucking luck doing that. We do at least have the context of Deltarune itself to help us get an idea of what this may be getting at, but ultimately this is Staggering Winds' take on the game and not mine. And I feel like it's important to work in those boundaries of what this specific take of the game is proposing when analyzing something like this. But even if I don't have much in the way of answers, I made this video because I wanted to not only bring more attention to it, but also because, frankly, even with the flaws it might have, I'm pretty fucking impressed by this. You don't really see Delta in web series like this every day, and for what it is, it's not only kind of thought provoking to me as both a fan and a theorist, but also it's just pretty fucking cool in approach. Having the first two videos be completely unmodified gameplay just to slap you in the face with something entirely new, and then going down the unused content angle for a game that absolutely benefits from its design being built around the practice of hunting for secrets and supposed unused content in video games, it's the kind of thing that just fits so neatly into what Deltarune already seems to be going for in my opinion. 
And I think the fact that it uses that to its advantage to get you to dig deeper into it like you would for Delta in itself in LA, I really have to give it props for pretty much building off of what was already there in the game to begin with. Is the whole implication that it's going down the game being personalized sort of out a bit overdone? Well, maybe. I suppose that's up to you and if you're bored of that concept or not. Personally, I think it's still a really neat idea in any horror or web series relating to games, and I think how it's applied even in this series is still pretty unique. Because I think it ultimately plays well into what I think Gaster stands for anyway in Deltarune, with his very nature being the fact that we know what we know of him mostly thanks to going off of the beaten path in various ways, both in the game itself and even in the act of file manipulation or data mining. Not to mention the idea that it manifests not through catering to the player, but rather the goners and cut content wanting to be included in the overall experience. The idea that there would be an unused or removed feature in the game that pretty much ties back to Gaster's experiments and motives and at its core is used to go way beyond where you're initially supposed to be, for better or worse, to find what's been lost and this theme of having more choice and more liberty over things at the cost of pretty much fucking up the balance of the world you're playing in, is very much in line with stuff related to Gaster, especially with the framing of these things only being discovered in a much older build of Deltarune, and one that had to be somewhat restored in order to actually get it to work as intended, and even then there's a lot of open-endedness and questions raised from what does work anyway. It kind of reminds me of something like Redacted actually from Undertale. Just these random assets and things that clearly were meant for something, but were then cut, only leaving these inexplicable remnants of what was supposed to be and thus making people go wild with speculation about what it could have been. It's something that I really can commend the series for making good use of, because honestly, aside from the occasional typo or glitch here and there, it's all weirdly believable to me. Especially because of how it uses already existing cut content and other strange bits of the actual game as a base for its own interpretations. Like, it doesn't sound that outlandish with what we currently know, and for something like Deltarune, managing to make something that does end up having these pretty large leaps in logic while still sounding rather in line with how the game is not to present things is pretty goddamn impressive. Like, I don't know, call me naive, but it's the kind of thing that, if I were just giving it a cursory glance, you could probably nearly fool me into thinking that this is a legit leak of the last leg of the game, or a new game plus feature or something. And even then, it still makes me think a lot about how the game is still prone to changes in the future and to turning out in so many more bizarre ways than we can even imagine right now, and I'd say that counts for something. And even with the absurdity of this newest video, where Undertale and Deltarune now have a direct connection and one game is fully influencing the other, while it's not really in line with how Toby for instance has said that your world in Undertale will stay untouched throughout Deltarune's course, it does bring me back to the days of when people did speculate regardless about the connections between the two games, like how, for example, perhaps upon Deltarune's completion there'd be an update to Undertale that uncovers the redacted assets or something like that. Again, it's not fully realistic, but it still brings those former absurd and out there theories and ideas about what Deltarune could be from even survey program days, and kind of brings them to life in a way. And I find that to be kind of cathartic and fascinating as a basis for the series, personally. Overall, that's about as much as I can say about Staggering Winds, though. It looks very promising to me so far, I'm really curious to see where this take on the game will go, and it's one of those things that's kind of inspired me to keep working on my end theories and the such, because, again, you don't see something like this very often with Deltarune of all things. Seeing its existing meta elements be taken much farther and developed into their own sort of story is really clever to me, and it does make me honestly just appreciate even more how Deltarune's approach to this kind of stuff already has made people resonate so much with it and run with so many ideas of where the game could go. Not just in terms of future chapters, but for just how goddamn weird it might end up getting. And thankfully, at least in recent news, while I desperately want to see so much more in that regard for the actual game, we do at least know now that Deltarune is going to drop again when just chapters 3 and 4 are done, so it looks like it'll be coming a bit sooner than I thought. But in the meantime, it's stuff like Staggering Ones that does a pretty good job with also scratching that meta-narrative itch just a little bit. And while I have no idea if it'll upload more frequently, I do like what there is of it already, and it's left me with good material to ponder on both for Deltarune and for the series itself. And I do hope it uploads more, because I'm honestly kinda invested in what the series may try to pull off. I don't really think there's anything like it, and I'm sure if it does upload more, I may even do a follow-up. But for now, I'm happy with just having gone through this channel as is with you all. And if you made it this far, then I hope you enjoyed this little journey as well. I remember when I initially wrote my analysis before the new video that I had a feeling the Cliffs route vid was something of a taster for a new arc of sorts to come for the channel. 
a bridge into just how much more wild things could get. And honestly, I'm terrified, but also happy to say that I was completely proven right on that just with this video. I really genuinely do not know what to expect with this series going forward, and in a way, I kind of like that about it. I don't want to retread old ground too much as I already said why I think the series overall is so interesting to me, but this shit is getting weird and I want to stay around for it personally. I've always loved seeing what people do when faced with pondering the idea of what Deltarune or Undertale could be, and I really have to respect how the series so far has used actual odd and obscure content in it as a base to take what could be as far as possible beyond even what I had imagined. And given what the ending of the video implies, with the viewers now potentially having a role in this, whether that be passively or, I don't know, through like an actual ARG or something, I'm starting to think even this video is going to look mild compared to what's next. So if you want a time to hop in on whatever the fuck might happen next with it, now is probably a good one to check it out and dig into it if you're interested. But with all that said, this video has gone pretty long, and now would be a good time to move on to the outro now that I've covered everything I reasonably could. Although, there's one more thing I'd like to touch on before I wrap up. One more little thing about this series that has had me actually fucking baffled in my quest to attempt to figure out the lore and story behind it. One of the reasons it took so long for me to make this video and to figure out how to do it was because I was worried that I wouldn't really have a good note to end it on other than, oh I want to see more of this series and it's kinda cool, but it felt like I was missing something. I don't know, I figured maybe including a bit about Help Tale or some other Deltarune ARG-ish thing, but it felt more right to make this video just about Staggering Winds by itself, even if I would ultimately end it on a kind of lukewarm and inconclusive note because there's not that much to work with still. However, very recently, I think I finally found that more intriguing note to end on. Now, I want to preface this by saying, this could be nothing. This could mean literally nothing and I could be looking extremely deep into it. But if you go into the comments of some of the videos on the channel, you'll notice that for some reason, Silver Gunner is mentioned by several people. Someone even claiming that Silver Gunner is the creator of the Staggering Ones channel and that this is some kind of ARG made by them. Now, if you don't know who Silver Gunner is, in the most simple terms I can put it, they are a channel that consists of people who upload high quality rips or a way of saying OST videos that are meant to make you think they're completely normal at first, but actually sound entirely different when you really listen to them. Like instead of what you're looking for, you'll find the song that uses those same instruments and stems, but it's now playing the melody of fucking, I don't know, Grandad or Buddy Holly by Weezer or some shit. They're more or less a music shitpost channel and one that I've known about since I was like a teen, so this name is ingrained in my mind. But you might be wondering, this is a Delta and Web series, what the fuck does Silva Gunner have to do with this? Well, you remember this song that played in the untitled video, as well as in the Undertale Let's Play, the one that was completely fan-made and unique to those segments? If you search up Goner Peace on YouTube, you'll find not just Staggering Winds, but a song on the Silver Gunner channel of that name, claiming to be an unused version, and it's roughly the same song as the one from the untitled video. Although, this version does sound barely slightly different, specifically to sound like the Nutshack theme apparently. So, okay, that's kind of odd and a really deep cut, but maybe it's just a reference that someone did on a whim, right? Well, I would say that if it weren't for the fact that the Silver Gun rip of the song was uploaded nearly three weeks before the video of the actual original composition of the song was uploaded. The rip was on April 25th, and the untitled video on May 15th. So, this raises a whole new slew of questions. I tried looking for who the specific ripper was, and on the wiki I couldn't find any name in particular, where usually a good chunk of rips will have the name of the specific person who did it. Okay, correction, uh, this is just kind of straight up wrong. Uh, there are actually plenty of rips on the wiki that don't actually have a specific name given for whoever did the rip itself, so it's not necessarily uncommon for rips to not really have a name given to them, but it's still really, you know, really weird that this one specifically just has no credit or anything whatsoever linking to the Staggering Winds channel, so uh, yeah, that's all. I just wanted to you know, prevent misinformation there. And I have been baffled by this discovery ever since. I don't know what to make of it, but it leaves me with two possibilities. One, the creator of Staggering Winds might just be a fan of Silva Gunner and may have submitted a shitpost version of their fan song to the channel. 
Self Gunner's uploads kind of go through a submission process for both team members and fans submit their rips to the channel, and it's pretty much vetted to see what fits best to be uploaded, so maybe this just happened to go through and the creator felt like doing something silly while working on the untitled video. And hey, it might have been a fun way to promote the channel as well, indirectly. Or... Two. An actual team member of Silvergunner did make this rip, and Staggering Winds is actually an ARG that may be connected to Silvergunner. And the thing is, Silvergunner isn't a stranger to ARG stuff. Some members have dabbled in this sort of thing before, so it's not entirely off the table to consider this. Hell, honestly, it goes so in-depth, and there's multiple of them too, I think, it's honestly worth its own videos. However, what makes me question this is that, as far as I know, the Garner Piece rip is literally just a one-off thing. There are no other rips from around that time that suggest that they're connected to the Garner Piece rip in that way, or that an ARG was even going on around that time. But it's such a fucking bizarre discovery to me that I just had to include it, because honestly, I don't know what to make of it. Like, yes, Silvergunner's done plenty of Deltern rips, but for something so specific for a channel as small as Staggering Winds, it could be one way or the other to me, really. But, I don't know. I'll leave it up to you. What do you all think? So, how do I actually beat these, the gay thoughts, by the way? They seem like really fucking strong and like I had no chance. And with that, I do think that is a better note to end this video on. If you made it this far, then of course, thank you very much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, feel free to drop a like and feel free to leave a comment as well about this discovery or the series itself or just my analysis of it so far in general. And hell, while I'm at it, if you really like my analysis and style in general and want to see more of it, while I'm never always sure what I'll be covering next, feel free to subscribe so I know what I'll make a new video or perhaps do a stream or two on occasion. I'm actually working on the last leg of a video series that's been currently ongoing called The Device Theory, which is my insanely long analysis on Deltron's meta-narrative and secrets and just compiling a shit ton of information on that and then making my own theory out of it. Currently, I'm done with the compiling information part, which is the first two parts of the series, and now I'm actually getting into the real theory, or in other words, the final part of the series. So if you're curious about that, feel free to give those videos a watch if you haven't already. Or, I don't know, even if you already have watched them and you want to watch them for like the billionth time, because apparently that's a thing now too. Which I mean, like, you know, I, like, you know I'm not gonna stop you, feel free to. And hey, this is gonna be a pretty lengthy outro speech, but given that this is my first actual video I've made after turning into a niche micro-celebrity on the internet with some substantial following, I do have a fucking lot to say, so bear with me. This is my first crack at really making a video that's kind of smaller in scope. At least my definition of small in regards to videos is fucking warped. Like, as long as I can get this video in like roughly barely under or barely over 60 minutes, then I can probably knock it out rather quickly, you know? But I did want to work on something that didn't feel as grand and all-encompassing as device theory for a bit. Part 3 is going to be done eventually, and I imagine even in the process of making this video, I probably have also concurrently already made the improved script and audio for Part 3, so I'm hoping by the time this vid's done that Part 3 will be closer to the point where I can just start the actual editing whenever I feel like and, you know, like just take my time with it. But I do hope this small detour into basically a niche within a niche isn't too fucking weird or abstract of an idea ultimately. I wanted to do something of a Halloween special for the channel ever since I started actually uploading to this channel back in like 2022, and even if I'm uploading this well into November and probably as more of a Thanksgiving special or something, I do think that making something just a little bit different honestly is really refreshing and, you know, like alongside the personal project stuff, making just a different kind of video is a nice palate cleanser after working on the fucking behemoth that was something like part 2 of the device theory for instance. But with that aside, I do want to say as always, thank you for your support and patience, and I really do mean that. In the middle of October, I actually hit 10,000 subscribers. 10,000. That is insane. Like, I hadn't even really talked about the subscriber count in part 2 because the script and everything was already pretty much done well before I had gotten all of this attention, but working on a new video knowing how people want to see more of my content, I was getting prepared to say thank you for just getting me past even 1,000, fuck, 5,000, but 10? I, I already can't even fathom just how much that is within these past, like, 5-6 months since the channel started growing a lot more. There's a sort of, like, a dream-like aspect to it where it's like, in a way, it's never fully processed for me. Like, I've settled more comfortably with this following, but the fact that it's much more of a reality now is... I, I can't be grateful enough for that. 
I've gone from just kind of making whatever and throwing stuff into the abyss and having no expectation of what might stick to now having something of an actual community that wants to see my stuff more and wants to see me keep uploading and while I do struggle with uploading consistently because of how naturally long form my content always seems to end to turning out no matter how simple I think it would be, I'm always thinking about what I want to do next. Obviously, I currently have a video essay series to finish, so that's like the priority as of this video, but even after that I have a lot of other stuff that I think would be fun to cover, both for Deltarune and otherwise. I do think that no matter what, I'm always going to try making videos and making more stuff because that's just what I like doing. I just don't know what else I would be doing with myself, like I was gonna finish Device Theory for instance regardless of how well it performed, but there is an element now where I do feel like I'm also doing it because I know you guys want to see more of it and the feeling that I I'm working on these videos to improve other people's days or even inspire them to make videos and theories and just other shit of their own. And being on the other end of that kind of interaction more or less, it's very wholesome to me. Like it feels like I'm right where I should be right now. And for that reason, and because I know there's a community for it, I want to keep providing for it and I want to give as much back as I can. I wouldn't be able to start supporting myself as much as I am now if it weren't for the support I got just from these past couple of videos, and I only have you guys to thank for that. I'm sure you've heard it from every other content creator, but I've always wanted to do something in this field for a living, whatever that might have been. And to be able to start carrying out that aspiration as a reality of sorts, I couldn't have done that on my own. Thank you all for giving me your time and your patience and just care in general for this dumbass gremlin here who's just making videos about things that are about a degree away from being completely incomprehensible in nature and subject matter. Again, 10,000 in just this past half year is just insane to me. I could not have imagined reaching this milestone so quickly. But we're here, and it's still counting, so I just want to go with and see where this takes us. I'm really excited to make more stuff for you guys, and I hope, if anything, that this video is a sort of glimpse into what content I usually tend to do aside from the stupidly long-form videos that are basically like one or two extremely large video projects a year to me. I'll save the more thorough thank yous and final words on how I feel about the state of things for like a more in-depth year in review and update video that I usually tend to make at the end or beginning of each year. But all of that said, I do want to know what you guys think would be a neat thing to do for 10k subs. I've been thinking for a while on what I want the 10k special to be more or less. I know I want to do something for it because it really is a huge deal to me, like maybe I could do a Q&A or something, but that like seems like the obvious thing to do though, so I'm just wondering if there's anything else I could do that would be like more personal to me and is like purely for you guys to be able to interact in a nice means of like returning the favor for getting me this far already. Aside from obviously just uploading more in general, right? But do let me know if any of y'all have an interesting idea of that. I'll likely give it a look and consider it because I do want to make a 10k special video that won't take too long to make but will be substantial for this milestone. But with that, again, thank you for watching. Really. I started this year with less than a thousand subs across both this channel and Molly M, and now we're already here. And I don't know what I could ever do to repay this amount of support being shown already, but I'm just gonna keep doing the weird shit I'm doing and see where it takes us, you know? Y'all are fucking awesome, and I hope to only continue being able to put out the best I can for you guys and to not always one-up myself because I feel like that's a one-way ticket to just being in a cycle of burnout, but rather make sure that I can improve the quality of my work to even further justify the support you guys have given me. At least in my head, it's my way of best returning the favor for sticking around in any capacity. I'm always working on something as I tend to say, and if it's not a video, it's always something that I know I want to show you guys and to give an idea of just what's on my mind at any moment. It's what I know best, and if people like that, then I really can't be thankful enough for being able to just do me and not much else. With that said, I hope you all had a good Halloween, or just having a good autumn in general, or I don't know, we'll have a good Thanksgiving or something, we'll see when this video is uploaded. But it really means everything to be able to make videos like this and have people see them and enjoy them as much as they do. And I hope to only keep doing more of it and to give you guys the best stuff I'm able to if I can help it. Thank you for your time and take care of yourselves. I'll see you next time, likely either in a more proper year end review and update or the 10k special or even the final part of the device theory. Whatever it might be though, I'll see you then. This was Molly and I'll catch you later.
Thank mm-hmm. you.